that can cause a believer to fall. Things that can cause a believer to fall. Now before I jump right into that, there's something else that I need to address. Shouldn't have to, but we have to do this. When I say that a believer can fall, a lot of times people will, will apply that to loss of salvation. It is impossible for a believer to lose their salvation. How many times do we have to preach this? And we have to keep preaching it because people say a believer can lose their salvation. How many times does God say in the scripture that you cannot lose your salvation, that eternal life lasts forever to be true? How many times does he have to say it? Just one time. So would you turn with me just quickly? I'm not preaching on eternal security necessarily this morning, but I believe this will be a good foundation. Because here's what people do. Turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 6, verse 37. John 6, 37. Here's what a lot of people do. They'll take, I call them cherry pickers. They'll go and cherry pick, pick out a verse out of Scripture, take it out of context. The verse is not even remotely talking about salvation. It's talking about service. And they'll say, see there, this verse is saying you can lose your salvation. Well, there's two things there. Number one, God has too many scriptures in the Bible that says you can't lose your salvation for somebody to cherry pick one and say you can. And secondly, if you can't lose your salvation, that is true, then we need to always ask this question. Well, since God says we can't lose our salvation, then this verse must be talking about something else. Has to be. Because he's done said one time you can't lose your salvation. So it's got to be talking about something else. So look at this verse. John 6, 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. How do we come to, him, to the Father? By faith. We put our faith in Christ. All that the Father giveth me, notice that word A-L-L, -L, all. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. What does that mean, no wise cast He'll never cast you out. Once you're on the inside, looking out, you can never be back on the outside looking in. In other words, once you're in God's family, he'll never cast you out. You're his child for how long? Forever. That no wise also means there's no wisdom can, that can ever go against this. God will never say prior to this that you can lose your salvation, that he'll cast you out. He'll never say here that he'll cast you out. He'll never say any time after this he'll cast you out. He can never go against this wisdom. So when you see another scripture that people say you can lose your salvation, then you can say, well, no wisdom can go against what he said. You can't be cast out. No wisdom can go against this. See, for he said, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, verse 38, but the will of him that sent me. What is that will? This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, that's those who have believed in him, I should lose nothing. I should lose nothing. God isn't ever going to lose one of his kids, one of his children. Not one of them. Of all of them, he said all, 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 all that the Father gives me, all, all. Of all of them that's he, that the Father has given him, those who trusted Christ, He's not going to lose one of them. Not even one of them. He can't lose nothing. He can lose nothing. But should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, verse 40, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have what? Everlasting life. Not temporary, not probationary. Not life you can have one day and lose the next. And I will raise him up at the last day. You see all the security here? Number one, he says, I'll never cast you out. No wisdom can ever go against this. Number two, of all that have trusted me, that have put their faith, believed in me, I won't lose nothing. That's two securities. Number three, he said, I should raise it up again at the last day. How can he do that if I've lost it? He made a promise. He's going to raise me up again at the last day. And four, I've got everlasting life. Four securities there. Does he need to say more? Let's look at one more verse real quick. John 10, 28. 
Now remember, God can't ever say one time, no wisdom can ever go against this, and then come back later and give a verse of Scripture wisdom that can go against this. John 10, 28 says, And I give unto them. Who is them? Look verse 26. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. How do you become a sheep? By believing. And I give unto them, his sheep, they're his sheep because they believed in him, eternal life. Not temporary, not probationary, not life you can lose. And they shall never perish. You know what that means? I can never go to hell in the future. If I can never go to hell in the future, then I can't lose my salvation. Never means never where I come from. And it means that with God too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not, should not perish but have everlasting life. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Neither shall any, you notice man is in italics, but neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. So Christ has me in his hand, and then the Father has me in his hand too. <laughs> That's double security, right? And then I have eternal life. There's triple security right there. So why are so many people going around saying, cherry-picking verses saying you can lose your salvation when Christ himself, the one who ought to know the best, says you can't? So that's just a little intro right there. You'll see why I gave that intro in a minute. So what I'm talking about is things that can cause a believer to fall. Number one, if you're a good note taker, you ought to write these things down. Turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll give you what that number one is in just a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 12. Wherefore, we'll see what the wherefore is there for in a little bit. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now he's talking to the Corinthian believers here. His is his audience, believers. So it's very possible that a believer can fall. Now what, here's what a lot of people do. They say, see there, see there, a believer can fall. And they apply that to losing salvation. He's not talking about loss of salvation. He's talking to believers. He's saying a believer can fall. Two separate animals there, two separate issues. It's highly possible, it's very possible that a believer can fall, or otherwise Paul wouldn't have took the time to wrote it by inspiration of God, would he have? No, he says, take heed lest he fall. So it's entirely possible a believer can fall. Now there's lots of ways a believer can fall. We're going to look at that today, but there's two primary ways, two general primary ways. Number one, by Doing things that a believer should not be doing. For example, in Proverbs it said, Pride becometh, cometh before, goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. So if we get engaged in pride, guess what? You're going to fall. Or have a haughty spirit, you're going to fall. Here's another example. In Ephesians it says, um, Be kind one to another, tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I've seen this. I know a personal example of this, of a believer who won't forgive another believer. You want to fall as a believer? Hold unforgiveness toward your brother. Unforgiveness. God don't like it, and you're going to fall because of it. You can mark it down. There's things we shouldn't do. If we do them, we're going to fall. That's one way. Second way, there's things we should do, and if we don't do them, we'll fall. There's things we should do. If we don't do them, we'll fall. For example, in 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to look at this in a little while, Peter said, and beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge patience, and to patience temperance. I may have that backwards. And to temperance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. He said, add those things. He said, if you do those things, if you do those things, you shall never fall. So we fall by doing things we shouldn't do as believers, and we can fall by not doing things that we should do. Sin, you ever heard the sin of omission, the sin of commission? We omit things that we should do, and things that we should do, we don't do them. Sin of omission, sin of commission. 
So we can fall. So watch this. I want to show you some ways believers can fall. Look at chapter 10. Remember I told you I'm going to tell you what the wherefore is there for? Look at chapter 10, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, and that means be a dum-dum about this, how that all, notice how many times it says the word all, all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So they had the same rock, Christ, and they all had the same spiritual privileges, right? They all had the same thing. All had the same thing. But watch what happened. But with many of them, it didn't say not with any of them. It said with many of them. Not with any, but with many of them. God was not well pleased. Was he pleased with Caleb? Was he pleased with Joshua? Yeah, he was pleased with some of them. But many of them, of the all, he was not pleased with. For they were, watch this now, overthrown in the wilderness. You know what overthrown means? It means to be made prostrate. To the point of death. That's what it means. Every one of these that he was displeased with, they died in the wilderness. They died. It's pretty severe, isn't it? They fail. And in fact, in Hebrews chapter 3, if you're in the power hour, he says, their carcasses fail in the wilderness. You ever seen a, a deer carcass on the side of the road? Uh, Gary and Darren and me saw one yesterday, right? Did we not? Is that carcass dead or alive? <laughs> dead. <laughs> Can that happen? Can you fall that far? Yes. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were written... Then they, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So point number one is a believer can fall. Point number two is a believer can even fall to the place where they're overthrown. They can lose their life. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? A man messing around, a believer messing around with his stepmother. And God said we need to take his life to save his soul. He, he was going to have to take him home before his time. It was going to have to come to that. Fortunately it didn't, but it could have come to that. Do you remember Saul, King Saul? Remember King Saul in the Old Testament? A believer, by the way. He was disobedient. God would tell him to do something and he would rebel. God would tell him to do something else and he was disobedient. A disobedient believer. And God said he was going to rend the kingdom from him and give it to a man after his own heart, right? What happened? It ended up happening to Saul. He died where? In battle. It didn't have to be that way. Can God take a believer home before their time? He sure can. You mean you can fall that way? Yes. He was so disobedient, so rebellious, God had to take him on. Samuel said, you're going to be with me. Where was Samuel? Paradise. You're going to be with me. Yep, it can get that bad. Does God want us to fall? Now, what does he want us to do? He wants us to stand. Ephesians chapter 6 says several times, stand, 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 stand. You don't have to fall. God wants you to stand. So here's the second point, or the third point. We can fall. We can fall to the point of being overthrown. Third, we can fall from temptation. Look at it with me. Verse 7, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some. You notice it went from all to many to some. As some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 
3 and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. What's he saying? He's saying some of the many that he was not pleased with, some of them fell into this temptation, idolatry. Some of them fell, I don't like to say into this temptation, I like to say from. It's not like temptation. Have you ever heard the song, Casting Crowns, Slow Fade? This doesn't usually typically happen. You don't, a believer doesn't typically fall by avalanche. It's by erosion. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices made. There's a price to be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. Believers fall, not typically by, by erosion, slow fade. It says some fail because of the temptation of idolatry, verse 7. Some fail from the temptation of fornication. Some fail from another kind of temptation. They tempted Christ, which means, when you tempt Christ, it means... God, you don't mean what you say, so prove it. Do you remember how he'd do one miracle, and after he'd done a miracle, they would question and murmur and complain, and he'd have to prove himself again and show them another miracle. He had no more done that miracle than they had to do another miracle. That's tempting Christ. And then in verse 10, some fell to another temptation, murmuring. So some fell to that temptation, some fell to this temptation, some fell to this temptation, but guess what happened? They fell. They fell. It didn't have to be that way. They fail. So that a believer can fall. A believer can fall to the point of being overthrown. A believer can fall from temptation. And I want to mention this again, even though we've discussed it. A believer can fall from idolatry. You know it mentions idolatry twice in this chapter? Look at verse 7. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now look at verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from what? Idolatry. Do you remember the children of Israel when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments? It didn't take them long at all for them to do what? Fall in from a temptation, idolatry. They, they said, let us make a golden calf. And they called that golden calf the God that led them out of Egypt. You know, God, you know what idolatry is? It's giving something else the love that only God deserves. It's given something else the honor that only God get, should get. It's given something else the worship, the adoration, the praise, the glory that only God should get. Is God a jealous God? Yeah, God don't want my love going to anything else, especially something that's not the true and living God, that's not even a God. No, it highly displeases him. You know what hurts God probably the most? Idolatry. You know why? It's like spiritual adultery. You ever seen a husband cheat on a wife and how broken it, the wife was? It hurts. It hurts a wife when her husband cheats on him, on her. Same for a husband. You ever seen a husband that dearly loved his wife and she cheated? Hurts. How do you think God feels when we cheat? When we give something else our love, our adoration, our worship, our praise, the glory that only he should do when we give it to something else? Y'all ever seen that movie, Fireproof? Remember that, the, the guy who had trusted Christ, but he had a bad habit, a sinful habit of looking at trash on his computer. He, but one day, a, a tra piece of trash come up on the screen, tempting him, but he got that old computer and he took it out, a ball bat to it. Y'all remember this? If you've ever never seen that movie, y'all ought to look at it. I cry every time I see that. I cry. He had come to a place where he said, that's not my idol anymore. That isn't worthy of my love. It hurt his wife so badly. But she, remember the little, this is the best part in the movie. He wrote a little piece of paper and he said, uh, I love you more. I cry every time I see that. I love you more. Idolatry is saying, I love something else more than you, God. And God don't like it. 
But can a believer fall from idolatry? They did. They fell. So a believer can fall. A believer can fall from temptation. A believer can fall from idolatry. Watch here. A believer can fall out of love. Look, turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter, I mean 1 Kings, sorry. 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. Fall, a believer can fall out of love. Turn quickly now, let's get there. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in unto them, number one. Number two, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Little g, O-D-S. 1 Kings Chapter 11. Solomon clave unto these in what? Love. He used to love the Lord. He used to hunger for the word of God. But something had happened. He had fallen out of love with God. And given his love to something else. Watch how many times it says, they shall surely turn away your heart. That's one time in verse 2. Verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Second time it said that. Verse 4, for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Three times it said that. Can a believer fall out of love with God? Solomon did. And he fell so far that he fell into idolatry. He said, don't do it. Don't do it, Solomon. Don't go, in, go into uh, other women and don't let them come into you, strange women, because they'll turn your heart away unto other gods. Look what happened. Verse 5. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then Solomon... Build, did build in high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise he did for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their little G-O-D-S. And the Lord was really happy with that, wasn't he? Verse 9, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him. Two things that does when you turn away your love from the Lord, when you fall out of love. Two things, it makes him angry because he's a jealous God. Second thing, it, it pierces him to his core. It grieves the Holy Spirit, makes him sad. But a believer can fall out of love. Here's another. Do you see why now I introduced you can't lose your salvation? Because people will say, see there, see there, see there, he, he fell, he fell, he fell. And say they, he lost his salvation. Not true. A believer's falling. Turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 2. On the same point, a believer can fall out of love. Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. This is a slipping church. Slipping, you ought to put in a circle right there. Slipping church. Slipping church. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works. That's good. And thy labor, that's good. And thy patience, that's good. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil, that's good. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, good. And hast borne. Now watch now, the key word in here is hast. And hast found them liars. And hast borne. And hast patience. And for my name's sake, hast labored. And hast not fainted. Like y'all look. Hast is past. Past tense. You hast. You did in the past do this. You hast, but that's past. You hast, but that's past. You hast, but that's past. They, pa they used to, but something has happened to them. What has happened to them? They've fallen out of love. Look what he says. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first Love. Can a believer fall out of love with the Lord? Yes, he can. The Lord calls it that. 
they used to be, they used to love the Lord because you could see their love. He said, I know thy works. They loved him, therefore they worked. I know thy labors. They loved him, therefore they labored. I know thy patience. They loved him, therefore they were patient. I, and thou canst bear, not bear with them which are evil. Why? Because they loved the Lord. They loved him. They did this because they loved the Lord. They did this because they loved the Lord. They did all this. But they used to. But what's happened? They've slipped. It says, nevertheless, I have someone against thee because thou hast left thy first love. It's in the past. It's not in the present. Remember, now look what God calls it. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art what? Fallen. Can a believer love the Lord, be doing great works and labor and patience and uh, going against evil and calling out people that are false and calling them a liar? Can he do such a great thing out of their love for God, but then that love dwindle, that fire go dim? Is that possible? Oh, it's highly possible. Have you ever been, remember the time when you were so intimate with the Lord, you loved the Lord, you'd do anything for the Lord. You loved him so much. But now something has happened. You don't labor as much, you don't work as much, you don't have patience as much. That fire, that love has, it's not what it used to be. That's possible to happen to a believer. It happened to the church at Ephesus. Slippage. They don't love God as much as they used to. He says, you need to go back to your first love because you've fallen. Here's another thing. Fall away. A believer can fall away. Turn. Now, this is something that is just brought to my attention that a person said, see there, you can lose your salvation. It's not talking about it. It's talking about falling. A believer falling. Look at chap Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 5. Luke 8, verse 5. This is the parable of the seed and the sower. I won't read all of it. It's not my point to try to bring this whole parable out. I just want to bring a certain soil mentioned in this parable. Luke 8, verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. Skip, skip. To verse 6. And some of the seed fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Now let's go to verse 11. He's going to describe what that means. Now this is, this, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Verse 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. I had a person say, see there, a believer can lose their salvation. They can fall away. What are they falling away from should be the question asked. Because remember, God can never say one time you can't lose your salvation and then give us a scripture or wisdom that can go against that. So you've got to ask you the question, what is, is this believer falling away from? Here's what they're falling away. They're going through a hard time. In the book of Mark, it said when the sun was up, it scorched. They were scorched. You know, what is he saying is, when hard times hit, when storms hit, when trials hit, when adversity hit, when persecution hit, when the heat's applied, when the pressure's on, this believer, he had believed for a while, but then he stopped believing. You know, I met a kid, I believe it was at a, I can't remember, it was at a basketball game or a football game, I asked this kid, he said, I was giving the gospel to him. This kid said, I know I've trusted Christ in the past. I know I've done that. But see, he said, I don't believe in him anymore. I'm an atheist. Is he still saved? Yeah, because how many times did Jesus die? One time. How many, when he died that one time, how many sins did he pay for? And when he, when he paid for those sins that one time, all sin one time, how many times do you have to believe in him to get eternal life? When you believe in him, you get eternal life. How long does that last? So it's a one-time belief, you have eternal life forever. So if you stop ever believing in the future, you're still saved. He won't cast you out. Should you do that? No. He's still saved if he placed his faith in Christ. So for a while, believe. Can a believer trust Christ and then later say, I'm an atheist and not trust Christ? Yeah, if he trusted Christ like he said he did, he's saved. But when hard times come, stop believing. 
And in time of temptation, it says they fall away. What are they falling away from? They used to believe, now they don't believe. For a time they believe, now they don't believe. That's one problem. That's a problem. That's an issue. But it doesn't affect their salvation. It's going to affect their walk. It's going to affect their service. It's going to affect their fruitfulness. And in time of temptation, fall away. They, they, they stop believing. And they fall away from receiving the word and receiving it with joy. Can a believer be, come to church? They're so hungry to get God's word. They've trusted Christ. They're so hungry to get God's word, but let hard times come. And then they don't, they get offended because, is this what it's like to walk with God? Is this what it's like to serve God? Count me out. Can a believer do that? And can a believer who were joyfully received the word, but when hard times come, they say, oh, oh, oh. I receive all the good stuff, the, the fair weather and the cloudy skies and the breeze blowing in my face. But when hard times come, mm -mm, don't want nothing to do with the word but that. Can a believer do that? So they fell away from three things. They stopped believing, and they stopped receiving the word, and they stopped receiving the word with joy. A believer can do that. Hope you're not there. Hope you never get there. Here's another thing. A believer can fall away from spiritual maturity. Turn your Bibles with me to 2 Hebrews chapter 6. We've discussed this in the Power Hour. Hebrews chapter 6. And look at verse... Hebrews 6, look at verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, saved or lost, saved people, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. How many people use this to say, see, a believer can lose their salvation? It's not talking about loss of salvation. Here's the problem. You would know this if you're in the power hour. In the book of Hebrews, these are mature believers. They built a work of faith, a labor of love. They've been in the fight with God, Hebrews chapter 10. They've, they've entered into the fight with their suffering brethren. They know there's eternal reward coming one day. They know this. But here's what they've done. They've quit. They've quit. They're living by sight and not by faith. And they've quit doing something. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. They were mature believers. But what are they stopping doing? They're stopping, continuing to mature. Can you be a mature believer and say, I matured enough. Look, I'm a mature believer, so I can quit now. I can stop. You know what's going to happen to that mature believer? Chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. He's going to treat you like a baby. If you don't use, if you don't use it, you what? Lose it. You can become like a little baby again. You have to be on the baby on the bottle. There's, they've stopped going on into perfection. Can a believer be spiritually mature and then become like a little baby because he stops growing? Yes. Yes. Look at verse 9. He said, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. I give this example. If I'm a mature believer, I should never get to the place where I say, Hey, I matured enough. I can stop. I can quit. Never. Because there's, there's still more maturing to go. Remember Job? God allowed Satan to try Job. Why would he do that? He was a mature believer. He said he was perfect, upright, feared God, and stewed evil. Why did he allow that? Well, one reason is he didn't show, want to show Job how far he had come. Job had come a long way in maturity. He was a mature believer. But guess what? God wanted to show him how far he still had to go. Remember God asked him like 64 straight questions? Could Job answer a single one of them? 
<laughs> no. He was showing Job, Job, you're a mature believer, but don't ever get to the place where you think you can, you've matured enough. You can always more room to grow. So a believer can fall from spiritual maturity. Look what it says in 2 Peter. I told you we'd get here. 2 Peter chapter 1. You remember the last dying words of Peter? What were they? Do you know? But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can a believer be growing in grace? You know what grow means? It means a continuous action. You know when Paul says walk in the Spirit? It doesn't mean just do it one day and don't do it, ever do it again. He means walking is a continuous action. Growing, a continuous action. We ought to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and keep growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord, keep growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord, keep growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord until the Lord comes back, the rapture. Keep growing. But can a believer not grow or be growing and stop growing? Yes. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this... Giving all diligence, add to your faith. Virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and, look, look, abound, means you keep on doing them more and more. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things... Is blind. It means you ought to have them, but you don't have them. Or maybe you had them, but you, you're, you're not diligent to keep abounding, adding them. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never what? Fall. So believers can fall. In a lot of different ways. That's just some of them. I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg. I'll have to do another message. But here's the thing. Don't ever apply when you see the word fall or fall away. Don't, don't automatically assume that means loss of salvation. Because you can't lose your salvation. But believers can fall. But you don't have to. God will never give us an option. Never put us in a position where the only two options are to sin or to fall. You don't have to fall. You, you can stand. Because right here he says in verse 11, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can have a shameful entrance into, the, into heaven, the eternal kingdom. You can have a uh, shameful entrance or you can have an abundant entrance. It's all going to depend. Did you stand or did you fall? A lot goes with it. A lot goes with it. Look up here. I'll finish this at another later date. But if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, would you do that? Would you do that? And it, Tyler's going to be coming forward in just a minute and close us in a song, but this is very important. If you've never trusted Christ, do that today. It's the only way you can know you have eternal life. In fact, you don't have to worry about falling. <laughs> As a believer, if you're not one... How do you become a believer? How do you become a child of God? How can you say, John, he said, if I'm in his family, he'll never cast me out. How do I get into the family? I want to be there. I, want to be on, I don't want to be on the outside looking in. I want to be inside looking out. I want to be his child. How do I become a child of God? Watch this. Let this hand represent you and me and everybody in the world. That's us. I'm going to let this wallet represent sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. But God loves sinners now. He hates our sin. Loves us. Hates the sin. I'm going to let this hand represent God. God is perfect. He doesn't have any sin. We do. Truckloads of it if we're honest. Here's the problem. Our sin, yours and mine, separates us from God. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. God wants us to be connected, not separated. We're separated from God by our ugly sin. And because we've all sinned, we owe a price tag. One payment, one price tag, death. Nothing else to pay for sin, death. It only takes death. That means we deserve to go to hell, separated from God forever in that place. But God loves us. He wants us to go to heaven. But to go to heaven, we have to be perfect. Most people think you've got to be good to go to heaven. It won't get you into his heaven. You've got to be perfect. The problem is, none of us are perfect. We're busted with sin. 
And all our good deeds will never, ever pay for sin. A million good deeds won't pay for sin because it's not death. It takes death to pay for sin. Works won't pay for sin. Let this hand represent Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. And this is what he did. Jesus looked down from heaven. He saw us busted with sin, but he loved us. He didn't want us to make that death payment go to hell. He did not want that. So Jesus did the unthinkable. He came down from his perfect heaven. He had no sin. He didn't have to die. He looked at our sin, hated it. He wouldn't even touch it. But he did more than just touch it. He took all of it on himself and died for you and me. You say, he, would love, he loved me that much? He loved you that much that he would die for you. And he did that because he didn't want us to go to hell. He loved you that much. All our sin got paid. That's why it's a gift. He was buried and he went back to heaven. He said, if you'll do one thing, it's the only thing you can do to know you have eternal life. If you'll place your faith in Christ, if you'll believe that he was the one that died for your sins, he was buried, he rose again. If you'll trust in that Savior, paid your sin debt, the moment you believe in him, God will be so joyful to give you at the moment of belief everlasting life. Home in heaven forever. You're God's child forever. He'll never cast you out. Because you're not worth nothing. You're worth something. He said, I'll lose nothing. You're his forever. He loves you that much.